text for the day, which comes to us from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And if you haven't figured it out yet, we're on commandment number six of the Ten Commandments, and we are reading the same text every single week. Do you have the Ten Commandments memorized yet? I actually don't. Um, this is a little secret about Pastor Chris. I have to write everything in the bulletin that I say, otherwise I mess it up. I can't do the Lord's Prayer, I can't do scripture texts, I will butcher it. So follow along with me as I read Exodus chapter 20, 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. <coughs> For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Last week we did honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Today you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not lie, and you shall not covet your neighbor's house or wife or male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we're going to talk about that phrase, you shall not murder. In Hebrew it's just two words, no murder. Um, and I'm going to spend almost the whole morning talking about the second word, murder. And some of you are thinking to yourselves, all right, hey, I didn't murder lately. I'm good to go. This commandment and I are doing great. Like, this is my favorite commandment because I'm the least mur likely to murder someone you might meet. Um, and my job is a, as a pastor isn't to convince you that you are. Today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what this means for our culture, for our society, and for us as individuals. Because we're going to see how Jesus expands the meaning of this text in different ways in the New Testament and then apply it to ourselves. So here we go. Um, just this last week. I was taking an Uber, and I was on 95, and I was heading south toward the Grove, where I live. And I love being in an Uber sometimes because I notice things that I don't normally notice. And so my eyes are open, and I'm driving down the road. And as I'm going down 95, um, I look up, and there's a billboard. Like, you know, one of those mega billboards that take up, like, a whole city block. And on this billboard was an advertisement for Call of Duty Black Ops. I don't know if you know what that is. It's an Xbox video game. And I grew up with video games, and when I saw this advertisement, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I miss video games. I remember the days when I had video games and got to play them whenever I wanted. When I had children uh, three years ago or so, I actually gave away all my video games, because it, like it was like a growing up moment for me. I'm like, I am going to become a man, and I'm going to abandon my playful things. My birthday was last week, I don't know if you know where this is going, and someone gave me an Xbox in my family. And when I opened it, I knew it was opening up this, like, part of me that shouldn't be there. And I opened up this Xbox, and I install it, and, like, I'm, like, I'm, like, tingling, right? I'm, like, so excited. And some of you are smiling. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyway, I'm, like, super pumped. I'm, like, this is about to become my new life. Uh, this is a big deal. And I'm opening up this Xbox. I'm installing it. I didn't realize that nowadays it takes, like, two days to install updates. So I'm waiting patiently, ready to go. And my mother-in-law happened to just buy me that video game that I saw, Call of Duty Black Ops. And what it is, is it's a game where you're like apparently protecting the world, doing something really important. But I turn on the game, and the first thing that I do is I start playing. And then I immediately realize something is totally wrong. My little ones are crawling around the room. And in this game, I didn't realize, or I hadn't thought about it in a long time. It is one of the most violent, brutal, bloody games I... I, and I i had been desensitized, I guess, to this in the past. But for the first time, I'm playing this video game in front of my children, and I'm like, whoa, I'm about to uh, get a call from CPS or something. Like, this is not going to go well. So I have to turn off the video game because I, I, you know, I hadn't played in so long. But one of the things that I realized 
is, man, it is one of the most bloody, violent things that you can ever do with your time besides actually do it. Um, I read a statistic that said that children that are born now between the age of 18, and this is a dated, so I bet it's even higher than what it is now. The t statistic said that between birth and 18 years old, they'll see or witness in media or television over 80,000 murders. And it's getting more and more realistic all the time. Trust me, I just played a video game this week, and I really thought I was killing bad people. It was inspiring, but it was also terrifying how real all this is becoming. And I was like, all right, it's just video games. I'm not a murderer, right? Um, but I had to like mentally disconnect myself from this intense experience. And I would just encourage you, if you've never seen or, or witnessed lately how real video games can become, um, you can play against me online Tuesdays at 4. Um, just teasing. No, you can't. Um, we're going to talk for a little bit about murder, that phrase, what it means. And in Western society, we've come up with a lot of different ways to describe what murder is. Let me just give you some of these terms. You know what they are. There's first degree murder, second degree, there's premeditated murder and unpremeditated. There's manslaughter. There's also suicide or taking your own life. There's capital punishment where we decide that some people should die and kill them as a society. Depending on your view, there's also terminating pregnancies and whenever that happens. There's euthanasia. So at the end of people's lives, we debate when is the right time to take someone's life, if at all. There's war and different kinds of war. People have been debating throughout history whether or not war can ever be justified. Was Jesus a pacifist or not, and how do we understand that? There's aggressive policing and whether or not some certain forms of policing are considered murder. In our own last 20th century, there's genocide, patricide, all kinds of things. We have a lot of different ways to talk about this commandment, murder. You didn't even realize probably that we had such a sophisticated vocabulary in English to talk about murder. That's how crazy it is. So what we're going to do for just a minute is we are going to talk about how this commandment gives us a vision for how life is supposed to be. Then we're going to talk about how this commandment gives us a guardrail for how we need to be careful and check ourselves. And then lastly, we'll end with just a personal story or two. What does it mean when we say do not murder? What does this mean? You know, one of the things we talked about with the other commandments is it doesn't just say what we're not supposed to do. What God's also doing is helping us explore what it, how life is supposed to be. When I was in Honduras not too long ago, we take a mission trip down there at least once a year, or we have for the last, uh, at least time that I've been here at this church, we do a Christmas tree fundraiser that is about to start in a month or so here at the church. And we go down to Honduras, and I will never forget that someone told me this. Um, Honduras, Tegucigalpa, where, which is the capital that we fly into, um, has the highest murder rate or did have the highest murder rate in the world for a long period of time. I was like, how can that be? I mean, what, why is that? What's going on here? And Jose Mahomar, who's one of our, our um, amazing folks here at the church, he's from Honduras. And he told me, he said, Chris, um, in order to kill someone in Honduras, someone that you don't like or don't want to be alive, it costs you $27. That's how much a life is worth in Tegucigalpa. Because $27, if you can get the money together, that's what you pay someone. And the way it normally works is you're on a motorbike, and then one person with a gun is on the back. And they'll be driving around, and then they'll kill you and keep moving on, and then they get their money. And that's how much life costs in Tegucigalpa. But I want to ask you a question when it comes to life. How much is life worth? How much are you worth? There are a lot of people that want to put maybe a dollar sign on your head or decide you're worth how valuable you are to another person. But for just half a second, take a moment to think about how valuable or how much you're actually worth. Have you thought about it before? This is what the Bible says we are worth. In 1 Peter, it says that you, talking about us, we're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That's a cool phrase. You and I are special to God. We're like that toy that a little kid has. Uh, my little daughter has Pup Pup and Bun Bun. She carries Pup Pup and Bun Bun around everywhere that she goes. She won't go to a grocery store or to school or fall asleep without her Pup Pup and Bun Bun. And to God, you and I are more precious than God's most special possession that he carries around everywhere. In Genesis 1, it says that you and I are made in the image of God. I.e., there's a part of who God is that when he looks at us, he sees himself. How crazy is that, that you and I are made in the image of God? In Isaiah 49, it says, can a woman forget her nursing child? Moms, 
Can you forget your baby or hear cries at night and ignore it? Isaiah 49 says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion for the child of her womb? Surely, too, God says, I will not forget you. The God of the universe compares himself to a mom hearing the cries of her child. It also says in Romans 5.8 that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, when God looks at us, he doesn't see the bad things that we do and that only. God looks at us as broken people and is still willing to die for us. And lastly, I want to remind you that when God sees us, he sees a new creation. He sees something that he values so much. Get this. If the most valuable thing to God in the entire world is life, what was God willing to give in order to bring us back to him? His very own. That's how precious you and I are to God. So whenever we say, how much are you worth? From a divine perspective to the one who made us, you and I are worth more than anything else in the entire world. The Bible says that whenever one person is found by God, it's like he throws a party and all of heaven stops what they're doing in order to celebrate how big a deal it is that someone who is lost is now found. You and I often determine our worth or our value by our bank statements, by our friendships, by our political connections, by the kind of jobs that we have, or the clothes that we can wear, or the cities that we live in. And those are all bankrupt, worthless things compared to the value that God places on you when he stares down from heaven. I'll never forget how it changed my life. I used to look at myself as someone who was just a mess of struggles. You know, when I'm alone with my own head, I'll think about, oh, I need to be doing this better. I need to be doing this better. Oh, I need to get all this together, and I'm struggling here and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes I just needed to stop and remind myself, you know what, when God looks down at me, he doesn't see a struggled kid. He sees his kid. He sees the kid that he died for. It's the same way he views all of us. So when we hear that phrase, do not murder, we think to ourselves, oh, do not murder, okay, don't do that. But what we miss in that if we don't pause to think is to reflect on how significant life must really be to God. Life is so precious. It is not worth $27. In fact, there's no dollar amount you could ever put on the price of someone else's life to God. It's an incredible, mind-blowing idea in this little tiny commandment. It gives us a vision for the way that things are supposed to be. And if we ever want to think about how life is supposed to be, what we do is we think about the Garden of Eden. That's a good place to start. Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 before we get to the fall. The fall is where brokenness and sin enters into the world. But before that, things were the way they were supposed to be. And in the Garden of Eden, was there death? No. God designed the world so that death would die and it was no, would not exist any longer. In fact, that's why God came back to earth, so that he could conquer the grave in many ways. That's how precious God values life. Whenever it talks about the Garden of Eden or about what heaven will be like, not only does it talk about eternal life and how precious life is going to be, that it will exist forever, but it describes a world in which there's no violence and no death at all. In fact, it says lion will, a lion will lay down with a lamb, right? As far as I know, in this world, lions and lambs don't cuddle. They fight and one wins. Another description of what heaven will be like in the scriptures is it will be totally okay to apparently leave a baby on the ground around snakes, and that's a totally safe thing to do because in heaven, there's no death. There's no violence. The dream that God had for the world that we've messed up and the dream that he's going to bring about in the future is a time and a place where there will be no violence and there will be no death and that life will be championed above all else. That is a crazy idea and we get that all in this little phrase, do not murder. But one of the things I want to lift up for a second is Jesus expands on this in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, you know, one of the downsides of the Ten Commandments is they took these laws that God gave us and they turned them into like a mentality where it was all about the law. And one of the things that Jesus did is he said, hey, the law is important, don't get me wrong, but, but, I care way more about the idea behind it, the motivation behind it. And so this is what Jesus says when it comes to do not murder. He says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. So Jesus is quoting the commandment there. This is Matthew 5, 21. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. 
Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, and in Aramaic, that just meant I hate you. Anyone who says Raka is answer, answerable to the court, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of fire and hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift on the altar, and so if you're making a, a, a gift, and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversaries. Do it while you are still on your way. And he goes on and on and on and on. Jesus could have said, hey, don't murder. But instead, what did he do? And I love Jesus, how he does this. He says, I'm not interested in following the command because there's a lot of angry people and hateful people who don't murder. But God was more interested in their hearts. God is always more interested in the thing behind the thing, what's going on inside and how you're processing and feeling about these things. And so Jesus' challenge to us is, and this is the vision, the vision is, is do you have genuine love for your enemies? Not just do not murder. That's like the lowest bar of the lowest bar. Jesus raises the bar. He says, are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to be reconciled? This is a dramatic challenge. You know, I would, you know, a lot of folks like the, old, the Ten Commandments because it's like, hey, this is a clear set of rules for how life is supposed to be. And I like rules and I like checking boxes. Jesus is not a box checker. He's really interested in the deep, hard work of the heart and the complexities that come with that. And Jesus says, do you have any anger inside you? Do you have any vindictiveness or hate going on inside you? That's what I want to work on and that's what I came to heal. It's a tremendous idea to think that the vision of do not murder is really uh, an, uh, an invitation to a life of life. So let's move on to the guardrail piece. Because all these commandments do a couple things. It sets a vision, but it also does a guardrail uh, for what we shouldn't do and why. And so let's move on to that piece next. So one of the things that this commandment teaches us is that the Bible is against what's called vigilante justice. The Bible is against vigilante justice. And that's the kind of justice where if someone does something to me, then what I get to do, or I would think I have permission to do, is to go out and hurt them. Um, I remember when I was in Kenya not too long ago, we were on a mission trip. Uh, well, we flew into Nairobi, but then we were working with a school in Nambali, Kenya. And we were listening to stories of the people who were telling us about how their village works. And there's not a lot of police in Kenya. Um, in this area that we were in. And so it was a, a tricky place, but one of, this is how the story went. It was one night they found out that there was a girl who came running to them who had been uh, either molested or raped by another person. And so what quickly happened is word spreads in a small town like this, and all the people in the village gathered together and immediately went out, hunted this person down, and killed them within an hour. And they're telling this story to us like, aren't we a good, safe city? And I'm thinking to myself, oh my Lord, I am scared to death in this place. Um, you know, obviously, don't get me wrong, I understand what it feels like a little bit, not quite as much, I'll be honest, but I understand a little bit what it's like to want to have vengeance or justice against wrongdoing. Um, not too long ago, my little daughter, she was in class um, here at the school, and whenever your daughter gets scratched by another kid, there's a report that comes that you have to sign saying that you're aware of it. Um, and so she got this little scratch on her arm or on her face or something. And I remember the teacher coming out, letting me, letting me know that I had to sign this thing, that I was aware that it had happened. And my first thought was, who's this kid? Who is this little child that dares scratch my daughter in class? She's two, you know? Um, anyway, like, it, it's silly and pathetic, don't get me wrong. But the emotions that welled up in my soul of anger, I had to, be, I had to like, check myself and be like, Lord... You know, she's probably going to do the same thing to someone else. I had to, like, rationalize it in my head. But imagine what happens when a real injustice or a real pain is done to you. Whew. Hate can be a very powerful thing. The desire for vengeance can be a real powerful thing if we're not careful and know how to check it. And one of the things that the Bible does is it values life so much that it says it's better if Two things. One, you don't immediately respond because all that will do is continue the circle of hate in your own heart. There's been almost no study that's ever been done that shows, or even anecdotal stories that show that you committing another act of violence to solve an act of violence ever gets rid of the anger or hate in your heart. And two, God values life so much that God has put in 
to place in the world through these commandments a system of restraint to help keep us from further damage and further pain in the world. For example, in the Old Testament culture, if, if you murder someone and someone accuses you of murder, it says that you are not to personally go and commit murder against that person. Instead, what you have to do is appeal to your community or your tribe or your city to do that act for you. So the Bible commissions the city to do an act of violence, but not an individual. And then it goes even farther. It says that if a person's guilty, someone has to have proof. There have to be witnesses in order to make sure that this isn't just a random act of vengeance, that it's truly just. On top of that, if you don't think you're going to get a fair trial in the Old Testament, that person would then run to another city and could go to a safe place where they think they could get a fair hearing. There's even a court of appeals within the Old Testament for how all of this is supposed to be handled. Why? Because God knows that you and I can be very hateful and vengeful sometimes, and it's better to have restraints and guardrails in our life so that we don't end up committing as equal an injustice as the one that might have been done to us. So that phrase, do not murder, is a guardrail because you and I could be murderers all the time. Let's just take a step back and think about this. In the 20th century, not very long ago, very, very soon actually, um, historically, over four people, four people, committed over 175 million murders in the world. Hitler, Mao, Stalin, and Hil um, Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao. Almost 175 million people were killed by those four people or their regimes. It's a crazy idea to just, I mean, it's so big you don't even know what to do with it. You know what I mean? 175 million people were murdered by those four people. And that doesn't include all the other chaos and craziness that happened throughout that. Now, one of the things I want to help you see is that without the scriptures, without this commandment, is there anything else in the world that tells us not to kill? You know, if all we truly are are animals that are the products of evolution, that have no souls, and the only thing that makes something right is the power behind it, these four people, believe, they were not Christians, they didn't even really believe in God, we don't think. And these four people believed that they had the right to murder because they were given the power to make those decisions. The Bible is a guardrail against anarchy and chaos. This commandment is a guardrail to say, hey, you know what? You may feel that way, but let's slow it down before we get to that point. You know, there's nothing out in the world that's telling you that you are of inestimable value and that your life is priceless and no one should be able to take it. You know, we, we, don't, we don't think about this commandment. We think about it ind individually, but we rarely think about it corporately because there are a lot of issues when it comes to uh, murder that we decide to do as a body of people and that we disconnect it. One of the things that I'm sensitive to or becoming more sensitive to is our culture is very smart, and whenever there's an act of violence, what it does is in order to perpetrate an act of violence, it separates the consumer or the person from that act of violence. One of the main reasons that I've started, I've been a vegan now for like three plus months, but one of the main reasons why I've been doing that is because I realized that I'd probably eat less animals if I had to kill them myself. Just the act of killing, uh, you know, what it does is what they do is they try to separate that from the eater as much as possible because that way you're disconnected from it, blind to it, and not connected. Now, now don't get me wrong, there's biblical justification, I think, if you want to find it for eating meat, and that's totally cool. I'm not pushing that in the slightest. But I'm just amazed at how when I'm disconnected from an act of violence, I'm more okay with whatever's going on. The same goes for the way we wear the clothes that we have. The same goes for capital punishment or euthanasia. One of the things that troubles me deeply is that most of our elderly folks are put in homes where they slowly disappear from our lives. We call them old folks' homes, right? But it didn't used to be that way. They would die in our arms, and they would die around us. And we've instead created a system of separation from death and from violence so that we can be happy and comfortable as much as possible. Now our armies are professionals and trained. And most of the killing that happens, happens at the push of a button by someone in a building with a drone that's high in the air. And again, I'm not debating whether or not war can ever be justified. I actually do think it can. But the fact that we've disconnected acts of violence from where we are means we no longer as a society are wrestling with it in a powerful and profound way. And that makes me nervous because we're less likely to make good decisions when we don't feel the weight of that decision. It's one of the reasons why Christians are called to pray for their leaders. 
pray for their politicians because they, hopefully by God's wisdom, are carrying out those very important and difficult decisions on a regular basis. This is heavy stuff. Does a person have the right to take their own life? Probably not if it's of inestimable value. What about folks that are suffering and pain at the end of their lives? All of this stuff gets very tricky, and I don't want to pretend like I have all the right answers to all these questions, but here's what I would encourage you as much as possible to wrestle with. Are you feeling the weight of that decision? Do you feel the value of that person's life deeply as you wrestle with that idea? Um, one of the things that breaks my heart here on Brickell Avenue is it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens enough that scares me, is we hear stories of people jumping off buildings. Um, People take their lives by, and it's in the papers here and there, but every time it's in the paper, um, it's rarely in the paper, I'll say that. And the next thing I've noticed, and maybe you've noticed this too, is the cops are there for a little bit, they clean it up, and it's like it what, never happened. There's no monument that's left. Um, I was talking to one person one time who was looking at a condo, and she just happened to be shopping for a condo, and they asked and inquired, like, so can I meet the previous owner? And it turned out that the previous owner had jumped. Um, out of a building just down the street over here. Man, it's a heavy thing to think about. These are real things that happen on a regular basis. In fact, there are plenty of murders that happen uh, not far from us. In fact, there's several murders, not several, several per month at least, in Overtown and in Liberty City, which are just up the road from us. If you haven't read about them, you should know about them. That's a reality. And of course, we were national news not a few months ago when someone walked into a school and shot up dozens of people. This is a real thing. When we talk about do not murder, it's really easy, like at the, we all joked, right? Ha, we don't murder, we're good to go, right? But we're all connected to a system where murder is taking place and we have to feel it more than we do. We're more accountable for it than I think we think we are and we're more responsible for it than the distance we've created between us and the violent act. The other thing I'll say is this, is the older I get, and I'm not very old, I know that, I'm scared of where this is going, but I, I lean more and more the older I get to just have a radical detestation for violence. You know, I, I was always more okay with it as a kid, but whenever I see someone physically being abusive or painful to someone else, and you really feel the weight of that violence, you really get a taste or a sense of how contradictory that is to the heart of God. Now, uh, a controversial issue is this, right? Are Christians ever justified in acts of violence? How would you respond to that? Was Jesus a pacifist? Have you ever thought about that before? Um, my position on this is I do think violence is justified under certain conditions, and Christian theologians have thought this throughout history. I'm not saying that all wars are or many wars are, but the idea that it's okay to stand up to protect an innocent person's rights, that force should be proportional, that it should be done as a last resort, I think in certain cases, violence can be justified. A good example was Dietrich Bonhoeffer in World War II. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian um, and a pastor under the Hitler regime, and he wrestled with this. He knew murder was wrong, and he knew violence wasn't, wasn't right, and he was as close to a pacifist as you can get, I think, in his heart, but he decided that it was the right thing to do to try to assassinate Adolf Hitler, and he got very close. His little group, not him personally, um, but his little group was responsible for an, an assassination attempt that was almost successful, so much so that Tom Cruise did a movie about it once, and that's when you know you're famous. Um, I forget the name of it. But the idea is this, is that under certain conditions, I do think war is justified, but only as the absolute, absolute, absolute last resort because the God that I know is a God of peace. And love is inconsistent with violence unless it's protecting someone who's in pain. Let me end with this story. Um, and I get this from Earl Palmer, who's one of my favorite pastors. And he tells a story, of, uh, this is the way he tells it, um, about one of, my, one of my favorite books I've ever read. We had to read it in college in the religion courses that I was in. And many of you have seen the play or read the book called Les Mis. Um, and Les, Les Miserables is a famous, famous uh, story written by Victor Hugo, and there's a scene in it that really captures um, the heart of God when it comes to violence, because this is how it goes. Um, there was a man who was, um, well, let me just tell you the story. This is the way he tells it. Victor Hugo wrote a great novel 
Les Mis, in which he worked a great theme. And it's one of the three greatest novels in his opinion, and this is how it goes. There was a man named Jean Valjean, and one night he goes into the home of Father Welcome, who's a bishop, a monsignor, that's the way he calls it in the story. And he goes into and has dinner at this bishop's home, Jean Valjean. And, and growing up, of course, he'd been convicted of a crime. He spent many years in jail. And while he was in jail, he started to get all this anger and hate inside of him. And when he gets released from jail, the anger and the hate starts to build and build and build. But one night he happens to find himself having dinner in the home of this bishop. Uh, this criminal person with a criminal past full of hate in his heart is in the bishop's home having dinner. And he ends up spending the night there along with other folks. And, and as they all go to bed, Jean Valjean wakes up, this criminal person, and, and he notices that there was some silver cutlery that was in the bishop's house. And he steals it. And so he takes all the silverware. Many of you have seen the, the play or the musical. And so he takes it and he goes out and he runs away, but he's caught. He's caught by the guards, and they see that he's got this silver cutlery, and it's got the bishop's like insignia kind of stuff on it, and they know where he stole it from. And so they take Jean Valjean, and they take the stolen cutlery, and in the middle of the night, they start pounding on the bishop's house. And they say, hey, do you know this man? He says, yes, I, I know the man. And do you recognize this? And they put up the stolen silver spoons and cutlery. And, you know, of course, what they expect to do is find this guy red-handed and send him off to jail or kill him or something like that. And the bishop does something totally unexpected. Even though he has the right to commit an act of violence or an act of justice against this person, what does the bishop do? He goes, oh, of course I know you. And what he does is uh, he says, oh, I gave him those can those, uh, that cutlery. I gave him all that silver. Oh, and one more thing. And he goes back and he grabs some silver candlesticks. He says, you forgot these candlesticks. And he gives Jean Valjean the candlesticks too, in addition to the cutlery. And the guards are confused. They're like, really? Why would he do this? This is kind of crazy. But then the bishop dismisses the uh, guards and they go away. And then you have this crazy moment where the man who had committed an act of injustice against the bishop is standing there alone with him. And can you imagine the weight of this moment. And this is the words from the novel. It says this. Jean Valjean was trembling in all his limbs. He took the two candlesticks mechanically and with wandering looks. Now, said the bishop, go in peace. By the by, when you return, my friend, it is unnecessary to pass through the garden, for you can always enter day or night by the front door, which is only latched. And then turning to the guards, he said, gentlemen, you can retire. And they did so. And Jean Valjean looked as if he were at the point of fainting. The bishop walked up to him and said in a low voice, Never forget that you have promised to me to employ this money in becoming an honest man. And it goes on. And there's this trembling moment where he experiences grace for the first time. This hardened criminal full of hate in his heart deserved justice against him for the violent act of stealing, right, and taking it. But instead what happens is he experiences grace where instead of just this circle of pain and violence and hate and murder and whatever that had always been a part of his life, for the very first time, a Christian person walks into that cycle and says, hey, here's some free stuff. I forgive you. What are candlesticks to me when your life is worth infinitely more? And he doesn't know what to do with it. If you know the play, like he's shaking so much he doesn't know what to do. But this is what you and I are called to do in a culture and in a society where violence is a regular thing. You and I are called to be reconcilers and healers in our world. When we leave this place, the world should be safer because you're in it. When we leave this place, the world should be calmer and more peaceful because you and I are in it. There should be no acts of violence unless absolutely necessary ever committed by a Christian society. Uh, Jesus was crazy on this point. You know what he said? He said, if someone smacks you on one cheek, you turn the other one. If someone takes something from you, you give them a second one. The reason why he said this wasn't because Jesus loved giving things away and loved getting hit. It's because he was willing to be the one that took the hit so the cycle of violence could be stopped. He was willing to be the one that stood in the middle of a circle of violence. One day there were people who were literally nailing his hands to pieces of wood, shoving metal into his body, and he took that act of violence and turned it into the moment that changed the world. Because he said, bring it on. I'm okay with it. 
I'm not going to respond in kind. I'm going to respond with love. That single act of nonviolence has changed the world possibly more than any other moment in the history of it. That is a crazy idea. As you and I go out into the world, we are called to be peacemakers, to be full of love and forgiveness and, and agents and ambassadors of reconciliation and peacemaking in this world. So are we murderers? Probably not. I feel pretty safe here on Sunday, although we always have a cop, just in case. But are you a reconciler? Are you a peacemaker? Do you bring justice into the world in a way that brings about peace? That's the vision and the, and the guide that God gives us in this commandment this morning, I think. Will you pray with me? God, we, um, we humble ourselves before the Ten Commandments. There's so much in them that is so big and so weighty and heavy. Help us to feel it. Help us to sense the heart that you have for the brokenness and the pain in the world. And help us to become people who are not participants in its brokenness, but healers of it. That is our prayer. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.